the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubry, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. And we're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Gloria DiPiero. We've the latest on the sex and bullying scandals rumbling around Westminster as one MP faces a suspension from the Commons and another is charged with a driving offence. Also, we're asking whether we're too quick to go to the NHS for ailments that we could easily deal with by just popping to boots. And we're talking about thalassemia. Do you even know what it is? Plus, Labour MP Marsha de Cordova, a working class black woman in Parliament, and registered blind. She tells me how she got there. That is all after your news. Good afternoon, it's one minute past 12. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB newsroom. A 28 year old man's been charged with the murders of four people in South East London. Joshua Jacques is accused of killing three generations of the same family. 64-year-old NHS worker Delette Hill and her 59-year-old partner Denton Burke were stabbed in their home in Bermondsey on Monday. Her daughter Tanisha Euphoria Kufo and granddaughter Samantha Drummonds were also attacked. Jacques is due to appear at Westminster Magistrates Court. A man has appeared in court accused of the murder of a missing mother of two in Lancashire. Police are still searching for Katie Kenyon, who disappeared last Friday after she was seen getting into a van in Burnley. More than 60 specialist officers are scouring a remote forest in the east of the country, county. 50-year-old Andrew Burfield has been remanded in custody and will appear at Preston Crown Court tomorrow. The government says post-Brexit import controls on European Union goods won't be imposed this year to ease the cost of living crisis. Traders are expected to save at least £1 billion with the new approach. The government will publish a new plan for next year. The announcement comes as Boris Johnson meets with Swiss President Ignacio Cassis to work on a new trade deal. The Foreign Secretary says Western allies need to double down in their support for Ukraine, delivering heavy weapons, tanks and planes. The call came as Russia's President Vladimir Putin warned of a lightning-fast retaliation if countries interfere in the conflict. UK intelligence shows that around 20 Russian Navy vessels are still in the Black Sea, capable of striking targets on the Ukrainian coast. Liz Truss says it's time to stand up to Russian aggression. Britain has always stood up to bullies. We've always been risk takers. So we are prepared to be bold. The war in Ukraine is our war. It's everyone's war. Because Ukraine's victory is a strategic imperative for all of us. Heavy weapons, tanks, aeroplanes, digging deep in our inventories, ramping up production. 
we need to do all of this. My view is that inaction would be the greatest provocation. This is a time for courage, not for caution. Conservative MP Jamie Wallace has been charged with failing to stop after a car crash in November last year. South Wales police say he's also been charged with failing to report a collision, driving without due care and attention, and leaving a vehicle in a dangerous position. Wallace recently came out as trans and revealed in a personal statement that he was raped and blackmailed. The MP is due to appear before Cardiff Magistrates Court next month. A Conservative MP has told GB News there can't be one rule for the Labour Party and another for the Tories. Richard Holden has written to Durham Police urging them to rethink a decision not to fine Sir Keir Starmer after he was filmed drinking with colleagues in April last year. He says it doesn't make sense that the Prime Minister received a penalty for attending an event in Downing Street while the Labour leader escapes punishment. Well, I think what everybody wants to see is the rules consistently applied across the country. That's all I'm asking for. And given the fact that the Metropolitan Police seem to have interpreted the rules one way and Durham Police a different way, um, I think it's really time that we examine those rules. Because the one thing that Keir Starmer's not really been able to do is explain what the difference was between what he did and what the Prime Minister's done. Uh, the only difference is the fact that one of them was fined and one of them wasn't. Labour's calling for the suspension of a Conservative MP accused of watching porn in the House of Commons. The government chief whip has launched an investigation after allegations about the unnamed member were raised during a meeting of Tory MPs. Shadow Work and Pension Secretary Jonathan Ashworth says the culture needs to change. It's shocking, but it, for me it's also utterly depressing because that building over there, that should be the arena, and it actually is still the arena by where the big questions of the day are thrashed out, like this cost of living crisis and the fact that pensioners are really struggling. We should be talking about those issues in that building. And there is so much misogyny, sexism, bullying. We're hearing so many complaints. The culture has got to change. And climate activists have damaged petrol pumps and blocked two motorway service stations. The Just Stop Oil protesters stopped motorists from entering forecourts at Cobham and Clackett Lane services on the M25. Around 35 people were involved in the action. The group says it will continue its disruption until the government agrees to end new oil and gas projects in the UK. This is GB News. We'll have more as it happens now, though. It's back to the briefing with Gloria De Piero. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, the week began with a row of Angela Rayner's legs and now an MP has been reported for watching porn in the Commons. Is behaviour in Parliament as bad as ever? I'll talk to former Conservative MP Anne Milton. MPs have been behaving badly in other ways too. One former Labour Cabinet Minister now faces suspension over bullying a former member of staff. Also. Do some of us rush to the doctor or A&E when a quick chat with a pharmacist might sort out our health issues just as well? I'll talk with Labour MP George Howarth. He led a debate in Parliament on this this week. And my Real Me interview is with Labour MP Marsha de Cordova, a working-class black woman in Parliament who is registered blind. It's not been easy. It's been a torrid week in Westminster, beginning with the row about comments over Angela Rayner crossing and uncrossing her legs, to an MP allegedly watching porn in the House of Commons. And now the former Cabinet Minister, Labour Cabinet Minister Liam Byrne, has been found to have bullied a former member of his staff. What a week. Our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, is in Westminster for us. Gosh, bring us up to date, Darren. Can you keep up? Uh, no, uh, frankly, is the bottom answer to that question, uh, Gloria. It is fair to say that Parliament and its MPs have not covered themselves in glory uh, this week. Uh, MPs are actually going on a bit of a break now ahead of the state opening department of Parliament following the local elections on the 10th of May. That's when Parliament will reconvene again. But you're right in saying that it has been controversy after controversy after controversy. The chief whip of the Conservative Party is looking into these allegations uh, alleged by a female Conservative minister that a 
a fellow Conservative MP was caught watching pornography in the Commons Chamber and also, we believe, at a select committee meeting as well. Quite extraordinary, really, jaw-dropping in many ways, uh, that an MP would feel that they could get away with this in the Commons uh, Chamber, that anyone would even do that at work, uh, let alone in the place in which our laws are passed. Uh, now, will they get to the bottom of this? Well, at the moment, uh, that female minister has not revealed the name, certainly in public, but the expectation is, and we've heard this from several senior Conservatives today, is if that person, and there has to be due process in all of this, of course, if that person is found to have done this, that they would then be suspected the expectation is that they would lose the uh, Conservative whip, that essentially they would at least be chucked out of the party uh, temporarily. So serious are these allegations. But you're right, this is just the start of what have been a series of problems for MPs, and it's not just confined to the Conservative Party. Uh, in the last hour or so, we know Liam Byrne, uh, former Labour Cabinet Minister under Tony, sorry, Gordon Brown, uh, has been found... Uh, guilty of bullying, essentially, by the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards. He's going to be suspended from Parliament uh, for two days. He was found to have ostracised a former assistant uh, in his office, uh, including uh, denying him access to his parliamentary IT accounts. Catherine Stone, the Commissioner, concluded that it amounted to bullying. Uh, the Labour Party have accepted that, and Liam Byrne will be suspended for two days. And then in the last couple of minutes... We found out that Jamie Wallace, uh, the Conservative MP, you may have heard of him recently. He, he uh, essentially came out in the Commons uh, saying that he was thinking about transitioning uh, from a man to a woman. Uh, he also talked very emotionally and touchingly uh, about that decision that he had made, but also about how he had horrifically been uh, raped. Uh, however, he was involved in a traffic accident or a traffic incident uh, last year, and the police ha have now charged him uh, with failing to stop uh, without uh, due care and, and attention following that uh, car crash, and also, I think, uh, leaving the scene. Uh, he is now due to appear at Cardiff Magistrates Court on Tuesday the 10th of uh, May. So he is looking potentially at a prosecution, as I say, for failing to stop and driving without uh, due care. So, all in all, from various different parties involving very different and separate incidents. As I say, it is fair to say that MPs have had a pretty torrid week. And there are further allegations we know about at the weekend, Gloria. I think the Sunday Times were reporting uh, that up to 56 MPs could be either being investigated or in some type of process about sexual misconduct, including allegedly cabinet ministers and shadow cabinet ministers. So there is no end in sight as I say, for Parliament and MPs uh, being brought into disrepute, frankly. Gosh, Darren, well done for remembering all of those various scandals that have come to light this week. Thank you very much indeed, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor. So it's not been a good week for women in Parliament. The week started with the sexist remarks towards Angela Rayner. As Darren said, 56 MPs are reportedly under investigation for sexual harassment. And a Conservative MP has been accused of watching porn in the chamber. Now, we believe passionately on this programme that we need to have political balance. And we asked multiple Conservative MPs to talk to us today, but no one was available. If you're a Conservative MP and watching, do get in touch. You're very welcome on the show. Joining me now is Anne Milton, the former Conservative MP, the former women's minister and former other ministerial um, holder of various ministerial positions. Um, and she joins us now. Anne, it is good to see you. Thank you for joining us today. We were very keen to get a women's perspective on all of this. Um, so a Conservative MP caught watching porn has no excuse, said the Defence Secretary this morning when he was speaking to the media. He also says, we all know what happens when you mix long hours, drink and pressured environments. What do you make of that? Well, it may be an attempt at an excellent explanation, but I don't think he intended it as an excuse. And it's not an excuse. Lots of people work long hours in high-pressured environments, but there is no excuse um, for bullying, harassment, watching porn at work, as everybody should be aware. 
What should happen to the Member of Parliament who was allegedly watching pornography in the House of Commons? Well, you've got to know if it's a, a first offence. Is this somebody who's got a history? Because I think one of the problems in workplaces is that there can be, say, bullying that isn't very serious, is resolved. It is the accumulation of multiple small offences, if we can call them that, that I think needs to be taken into account. In other words, does their behaviour as a whole fall short, fall short of what you would expect of somebody elected to public office? And I, I think if anybody, I think, if anybody was caught watching porn at work um, and it, it is reported that a, a female colleague um, was witness to that, which is why it has come to light, I think your job would be in jeopardy. It's really difficult, though, with MPs, isn't it? Because it's not a normal employment contract. How can you discipline them? Well, it's, it's not employment is the problem. MPs are, as you know, Gloria, in effect self-employed. Um, I'm sure the Speaker of the House will have something to say because ultimately he has say over anything that goes on in the House, particularly in the Chamber. So I'm sure he will at some point opine on it. But it is really very depressing um, and, and shocking. Watching Paul in the Chamber of the House of Commons is actually quite a shock, even to me. And, you know, I was Deputy Chief Whip and, and got to hear a lot of what went on. Um, but I've never heard of that. It feels like every day there is a new thing that we're hearing about. And you spent 14 years as a Member of Parliament. Looking back at those 14 years, would you say that there is a culture of misogyny, of bad behaviour in the House of Commons? I, I think what I'm not absolutely sure about is whether it always went on and we didn't hear about it or whether there's been an escalation. And... Um, you know, my time as Deputy Chief Whip, I did get to hear about a, a lot of the concerns about bullying, about sexual harassment, and in an extreme case, uh, a sexual assault. Um, certainly, this latest raft of things feels worse than what I saw and heard at that time. I, I think the culture isn't great. It never has been great. You know, um, when I was elected as an MP, I made up only one of 16 women that were female MPs in the Conservative Party. So, and there's been a big shift since then. And you would imagine, wouldn't you, if the gender balance, if there was better gender balance, i.e. there were more women, then change in culture and attitudes would change. It would not appear so at the moment. But to some extent, that comes from, you know, if you want to change culture and any organisation that wants to change culture knows the role that leadership plays in all of this. So it is beholden to anybody who is in any sort of leadership role um, in whatever bench they sit on to demonstrate by example. And just finally, were you subject to either conscious or unconscious sexism while you were an MP and, and a minister? It's certainly unconscious. I, I never directly, I never felt that anybody had been directly sexist against me. Um, there was an unconscious sexism, which is often well-intentioned. People coming up to you, putting their arm around your shoulder, a man, and saying, you know, Anne, that was a brilliant speech as if you couldn't make a brilliant speech. And, and so I think there is some unconscious sexual bias, um, but never overt um, at all. We're very grateful for your insights, thoughts and, and testimony too. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anne Milton. It's a pleasure, Gloria. Thank you. Coming up, are we too quick to go to the doctor when a trip to the pharmacist might do? We'll hear from the MP who has been leading a debate in Parliament on that very issue this week. Before that, it's time for a short break.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, are we too quick to go to the doctor or A&E for things a quick word with the pharmacist might be able to sort? Labour MP George Howarth led a debate calling for a national self-care strategy. It could help reduce the strain on the NHS. And I'm delighted uh, George, who is also Labour MP for Knowsley, Nosley joins me now. George, um, your first time on, on the show, I think on it the is, channel. Yes. You are very welcome indeed. Before I talk about what is a very interesting debate that you, you led, um, I just want to ask you whether you... I mean, it is hard to conclude after the events of this week that there isn't a culture of sexism in our parliament. Would you agree with that? I think it, uh, it's important to say a couple of things. Um, in more general terms before I speak about Parliament. The first is that there's been a, com a noticeable lowering of the respect people pay to each other. Mm. And particularly, uh, women seem to be much more on the receiving end of it. And secondly, um, a, lower, um, a, a lack of understanding about where the boundaries lay. And, you know, if you... Some of it, not all of it, but some of it seems to come from the social media where all bets seem to be off and anything goes on some platforms. So that's the general uh, principle. The, the other thing that worries me in, in terms of Parliament is that it takes too long. People make a complaint, whether it's about bullying or sexism or sexual harassment or... And then it takes too long to resolve. Now, I realise that there are reasons for that to do with the process. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me that people who make a complaint should expect to have it resolved quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's reasonable. And, and just if I may get your reaction to your colleague, uh, Liam Burns, who has been recommended that he be suspended for a couple of days from the House of Commons for bullying a former member of staff. I don't want to comment on Liam's case specifically because, to be honest, I don't know enough about it. Um, but certainly, as I've said of other problems, it isn't... Ex if anybody has been involved in bullying, um, then it's important that it's dealt with properly um, and in a way that the person who made the complaint can feel that they've been taken seriously but also the public can be reassured that Parliament doesn't um, condone 
bullying of any kind. It doesn't matter whether it's a visitor, a member of staff or somebody you directly employ. It simply is not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's talk about the debate that you led in Parliament this week on self-care. Um, you said it's about actions the individuals take for themselves to protect or maintain their health. I thought, sounds like a Tory idea when I first read it. Tell me why I'm wrong. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to note, I'm not saying that self-care is the same thing as no care. You know, those who need medical attention from trained professionals should get it. Um, but, you know, in your opening question, um, you pointed out that, you know, some people were using A&E or GP practices for things that actually they could deal with at a pharmacy. Um, a couple of eggs. I mean, the, the last set of statistics I've got is if you take A&E visits and GP visits together, you're talking about over 20 million people who are going to complain about things that... Um, are minor ailments, you know, a couple of examples, travel sickness and dandruff. Well, to be honest, you can get good advice from your local pharmacist yeah. about how to deal with either of those and a number of other yeah. um, ailments that people present themselves at A&E or a GP with. I was just astonished when I read those figures in your speech. Estimated that 18 million GP appointments and 3.7 million visits minor ailments, including a blocked nose, dandruff and yes. travel sickness. This is, it, it's incredibly expensive for the NHS, Absolutely, isn't it? yeah. I think you're talking about, I can't, the, the figure is somewhere between one and two billion pounds, I think 1.8 billion yeah. pounds. And obviously, you know, the problems we've got in the health service, 1.8 billion pounds yeah. could be much better spent elsewhere. Uh, than dealing with things that could simply be dealt with by a visit to the pharmacy. Yeah, and I was also interested, because you also um, gave the example in your speech about diabetes. Yes. Um, uh, some shocking figures in there uh, as well. But can you manage diabetes if you're given the right support and information yourself? You can do. Um, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to undermine the fact that um, anyone with particularly type 1 diabetes, but type 2 as well, um, does need medical support. So I'm not saying they can do everything themselves. Um, it's just not feasible for them to do that. But the more they can get uh, uh, education, psychological support, um, the more they can get the technical support, because the technology that's available now helps them um, to be able to control their own diabetes, um, the better they will feel for it, their well-being, um, you know, the, the, the general physical health will benefit from that. Um, but there are exceptions to that. Um, I think I mentioned in the debate that uh, Theresa May and myself are shortly going to um, conduct an inquiry into type 1 diabetics who, by omitting to take their insulin, um, end up being able to uh, lose weight rapidly. Mm. Mm. But it will cause all sorts of physical health problems, in some cases, fatally. Um, and that needs clearly um, the support of medical practitioners and yeah. how that's organised, we want to, to look at. I mean, there's an interesting... I don't know whether I'm allowed to bit, mention... A bit short of time. Go, go on, go on. There's an interesting storyline in Coronation Street right. at the moment about a young woman who is having... who, with type 1 diabetes, is um, also experiencing an eating disorder. And I don't know yes. how it's going to end, yes. but yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk to you about this more. Really interesting that you're doing this inquiry with uh, Theresa May. Thank you for coming on the show today, George. Thank you. Hope it's the first appearance of many. Coming up, I have a very special interview with Labour MP Marcia de Cordova, who opens up about her challenges around her eyesight. That is after the news. Ah, forgive me. Forgive me, we are now going to Mark White, our Home and Security Editor's package on the passport delays. 
After two years of effective COVID lockdown, unsurprisingly, millions of Brits are desperate to get away this summer. But the dream of foreign beaches is fast becoming a nightmare for increasing numbers of people who are being caught up in delays at the passport agency. Huge demand post-COVID has tripled the normal processing time for people like Sophie Power, who've experienced long delays in receiving their passport and accompanying documents. In her case, putting a new job overseas at risk. It's been incredibly stressful, especially when you're on the phone to people that just don't have any answers. I was told weeks ago that Liverpool had my passport on the 28th of March. Well, we're now nearing mid to end April and there was no other information which was when they discovered that it, the likelihood was actually that the document was lost. In a normal year, 7 million passport applications would be received. This year, the passport agency expects to receive 9.5 million applications. Before the pandemic, processing a standard passport application would take around three weeks. Now the passport agency is warning people to be prepared for possible delays of up to 10 weeks. Much of the delay is being blamed on the pandemic, which saw 5 million passports expire over the two years of lockdown. Many of those owning out-of-date passports delayed renewing them and are only now going through that process. But the passport agency is still being accused of failing to prepare properly for a foreseeable surge in demand. We've had one constituent who, if she doesn't get a passport in the next week or so, is going to miss out on a job she's secured in America. We've had another who uh, missed, a uh, young girl who missed half of her holiday in the end, just managed to make her uncle's wedding, but, but looked set to miss out there. We've had a, a third constituent uh, just yesterday who's had to cancel their holiday because they've been waiting 13 weeks for the passports. And from the perspective of the government, they've just got to sort this shambles out as a matter of urgency. Downing Street's Chief of Staff is meeting face-to-face -face with Passport Agency management today. The last thing the Prime Minister wants is a growing backlash from an angry public unable to get their passports in time. In the meantime, the Passport Agency is urging applicants to use digital photo booths where they receive an automated digital code to help ensure their online applications are dealt with more speedily. Mark White, GB News. It is 12.31 and now it is time for the news with Rhiannon. Thanks, Gloria. It's 12.31. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. A man's in court charged with the murders of four people in southeast London. Joshua Jacques is accused of killing three generations of the same family. 64-year-old NHS worker Delette Hill and her 59-year-old partner Denton Burke were stabbed in their home in Bermondsey on Monday. Her daughter Tanisha Forig Akufo and granddaughter Samantha Drummonds were also attacked. A mother who's addicted to heroin has been jailed for 20 years for the gross negligence manslaughter of her seven-year-old son. Hakeem Hussein, who is asthmatic, died after Laura Heath used his inhalers to smoke crack cocaine. His body was found in a garden in Birmingham in 2017. Conservative MP Jamie Wallace has been charged with failing to stop and driving without due care after a car crash in November last year. Wallace recently came out as trans and revealed in a personal statement that he was raped and blackmailed. The MP is due to appear before Cardiff Magistrates Court next month. The government says post-Brexit import controls on European Union goods won't be imposed this year to ease the cost of living crisis. Traders are expected to save at least £1 billion with the new approach. The announcement comes as Boris Johnson meets with his Swiss president Ignacio Cassis to work on a new trade deal. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Gloria is back with a briefing in just a moment. Don't go anywhere.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10am until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, International Thalassemia Day is on the 8th of May. Labour MP Bambos Sharalombos held a debate to raise awareness this week and he joins me in the studio now. He's the Labour MP for Enfield Southgate and also Shadow Foreign Office Minister. Thank you for coming back on the, on the programme. Now, what we all want to know, because I only know about the answer to this in researching uh, this interview, what is thalassemia? Well, it's an inherited blood disorder that affects the production of haemoglobin in the blood and people with thalassemia that have the, um, the beta major form of thalassemia, um, they need to have regular blood transfusions. Right. So, like, uh, every three weeks they have to have a blood transfusion uh, and that leads to other conditions being... Uh, it affects their liver um, and it's, it's, it's a life-limiting condition. Right. And how, how many people have it? I know your constituency has the highest number of people with thalassemia in the UK. How many people have it? it Why your constituency? So it's around... Um, it, it's probably less than 1,000 across the UK. Oh. So it's a rare disease, right. but it's, uh, it is quite... Um, it, for people that do have it, it is really... Um, it really badly affects and interrupts their life. Uh, and there are very few... Um, treatments that can be can help ease that. And what do we need to do? Is your debate primarily about raising awareness and therefore getting more resources? Yeah. Killed? So, in, in, uh, International Thalassemia Day, it's got its strap line is "Be Aware, Share, and Care." So the first issue is about raising awareness. Uh, the second one is about sort of telling stories about it, and the third is looking at the care that people receive when they go to mm. hospital. Um, to get their treatment. And how do you know if, if you have it? What are the... It's, it's a very simple blood test. It's a genetic, uh, it's hereditary um, uh, disease and uh, you just do a simple blood test and we'd encourage more people to actually uh, get a blood test to make sure that they don't have uh, thalassemia or if they do, they can actually get the advice and support mm. they need. Um, um, yeah, no, no, forgive me. I thought you'd finished. Um, thank, thank you for bringing that to our attention and for raising it in Westminster. Just want to ask you about the news of the, the week, the day. Um, is there a culture of misogyny and sexism in Parliament or do we have a few bad apples? Um, as a man, I don't come across it, but having spoken to my female colleagues, they do tell me that they do come across it on a regular basis. Uh, so I do think there is um, a problem with uh, misogyny 
uh, in Parliament and it does need to be addressed. And it's cross-party, you can't blame one party or another, it's just, it, it's a problem in our politics, in our society. It is, yeah. I think it's not just politics, but uh, it is prevalent in Parliament. I think it's a wider problem. Uh, I think the um, harassment of uh, girls and women is uh, a problem across the across society and we need to address that as well. Bam Boss, it's really uh, good of you to come in the studio today. Uh, you're always very welcome on the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you now, today, I have a wonderful interview with Labour MP and former Shadow Women's Secretary, Marsha de Cordova, and all the barriers she has had to overcome in life. And I hope it inspires other people. It certainly inspired me. Marsha de Cordova, you are registered blind. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the nature of the visual impairment that you have. That you were born with? Well, it's lovely to see you firstly. So I was born with a condition called nystagmus and nystagmus is an involuntary movement of the eye which has caused me to be severely short-sighted. So you'll probably notice my eyes move around a bit. I can't feel them moving but they do wobble around and I, and I do call it my wobble. Um, my mum first discovered something was wrong when I was quite a young actually, I was a baby, and she noticed that I wasn't really making any eye contact with her. So she, obviously she took me to the hospital, got me checked out, and then I had my um, diagnosis. And there it begins, really. Describe the impact that it, it has. Extremely short-sighted, I think, was the word that you... I use all severely, yeah. I'm registered severely sight-impaired. And, um, you know, the impact it's had growing up, my mum, because it's just my mum and my siblings at home, she always um, treated me exactly the same as my siblings, so she didn't treat me any differently. Obviously, there were certain things that I couldn't do. I wasn't really allowed into the kitchen, for example, because I would have an accident. Very accident prone, so I was really clumsy, always falling into things. If we were out playing in the fields, I would be the one to fall down in cow mess because obviously I couldn't see. Um, but it was, all, it was all part of it. I learned to ride a bike like my siblings. You know, I played games. Obviously, I couldn't play games with a small ball because I wouldn't be able to see it because the the impact of my of my sight loss is I can't see things that are far away. Things have to be really, really close up, um, close up in front of me to be able to actually see and focus on them. So, you know, there are difficulties and there are many barriers that I experienced with that. Um, you know, I, I can talk a bit about school, but I should say, you know, going to the eye hospital as a child, it was a bit of a treat. Me and my mum would go together because I would get a day off of school. <laughs> Not sure if that's a good thing, but anyway, it was fun back then. Um, and we got to spend time together and, you know, I wore glasses throughout my, my childhood up until my early 20s. It didn't really make a huge difference because my condition is there's just no cure. And I, I should probably say, um, you know, growing up for me, as I got older in my teens and certainly in my 20s and 30s, showing my age again, um, I kind of always had a bit of hope that I would go and the ophthalmologist would give me a bit of hope and tell me about some sort of cure or that, you know, I am going to be able to see again. And that hope never, ever came. And it's something that I've really had to come to terms with because it, it, it is a struggle. Even now, today, you know, woman, I'm an MP, I have my, my life, but it's still really uh, difficult trying to overcome some of those challenges that it that it brings with it. But I'm very grateful to, to my mum in a, not treating me any differently, but also being my champion throughout my life, particularly when it came to my education. Just, we're going to talk more about your experiences, mm. but I was just interested, you said it was just just your mum that, that yeah. brought brought you all up. Yeah. Do, do you know your dad? I, I do, but know, know who he is, yes, absolutely. But my I'm, my mum was a single mum and she raised me and did a good job, along with my, my aunties and all my siblings and cousins. Right, let's talk about your experience. So you get to school. Mm. School can be quite an unforgiving place for yeah. anybody who is different. And it mm. doesn't take much to be different, but you mm. were clearly different. Very much so. I mean, look, it goes back. I, I've got memories. So I school, um, had a few problems there. My mum arrived early one day to pick me up and found me sat in the corner while all the other children were having reading time. And uh, she said, you know, well, why is my daughter here? And they're saying, oh, she was being a bit disruptive because she kept wanting to sit at the front. And my mum was like, it's because she can't see. Um, 
So that was the last time I attended that particular nursery and she moved me to a wonderful nursery called The Limes where I flourished. And then in primary school, the challenge she faced there was really difficult because at that time, the head teacher felt it might have been better if I was placed in a special school um, because she thought it'd be easier for me. Um, my mum fought to keep me in mainstream school. I had lots of assessments and stuff. And, you know, the outcome was with the right support, she should be able to stay in this school. Uh, and that's what happened. I had a lady called Mrs. Harris come into school and, you know, help me in certain lessons. And also I had one-to-one -one time with her. Um, and I can honestly say, I, A, I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now, which is great, but I also wouldn't be the woman I am today as well. So I really do um, place all of the, the, the thanks and praise to my mum. But more importantly, back then, you know, Gloria, special schools weren't a great place. And, you know, as, a, as somebody with um, that's blind or partially sighted, you're probably just going to be learning how to weave baskets or, or tune a piano. And nothing wrong with those two things at all. But obviously, there were greater things ahead for me. So I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity. But you know, growing up, children can be cruel. <laughs> of course they can. You know, you get called different names uh, and things. And that happened, you know, throughout my, my childhood. What was be... the worst name you were called? Oh. Oh, you, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. <laughs> it was a horrible name. And, um, yeah, these boys used to call me Night Rider. I don't know if you remember the car Night Rider growing up because the, the lights used to move from left to right. So... Yeah, it was really cruel, but you know, it, it made me who I am. So I'm a tough cookie. You are. I have to stand up against so many challenges that come my way. And so, you know, all of those things that happened has really just made me the woman that I am. I am today, really. And you're smiling throughout. <laughs> Whatever you're describing, you've just got this wonderful smile. It's really lovely. Were you always academically gifted then at school? Because you go to university, so yeah, you're clever. I mean, yeah, I mean, I went back to uni, uni as, a, as a mature student, ah. actually. So I was in my very early 20s when I went back, when I went to study. And that was because of different circumstances um, that were at play. But, you know, by then I'd really learned to have a voice. And so whatever support I would need, I was never afraid to ask for it. Again, I, you know, I go back to my mum always kind of giving me that confidence to do that. And so, I, you know, at college I was able to demand in many, many cases the support that I needed and the same at university as well. So, you know, making sure all my papers were in the right format, having additional time for my exams. But also, you know, there are times when books, I mean, I did law and European policy, so you're not gonna get all law books in large print. So looking at alternative ways and using different aids and adaptations to ensure that I could study on the, the same footing as, as, my other, um, as my fellow students as well, so. Do you think you're typical of, I don't, I don't know if most people would fight as hard as you have mm. to get what you deserved or are entitled to. Yeah, um, I'd like to think so, but I'd also like to see like all the barriers that I've had to overcome. I hope they can inspire other people that have my same condition. And, you know, I do get emails and letters from, from parents who are so inspired by me and share my story with their children, which does really make me, you know, it. It's nice to know that although it's painful sometimes to go through it and experience what I experience, if I'm helping a parent as they, you know, dealing with a child with my condition to give them the confidence and also to inspire their children, then you know what, uh, it's my space, I will do that. I'm anchored in my faith, so it's, a, it's okay for me to do. I like to think, you know, I look at people like David Blunkett when I saw him in Parliament with his big, huge guide dog. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and you know, you're inspired by him. And, you know, and he, he, he's, he has no sight, literally. And he was an incredibly successful politician and, you know, and an advocate for disabled people and for people that are blind as well. And you're just inspired by them. But, you know, the key thing for me, I didn't come from any privilege. Um, nothing was handed to me. I fought for everything that I have, and I continue to fight to this day, actually. What did your mum do? Um, so she was at home with us, and then obviously she was at school, she was the lady, and she also cleaned as well. So she was, honestly, she's- in, Your in, mom. Is incredible. What's her name? She her, name's, her name's Yuna. She's you, amazing. <laughs> Yuna. Yes. What a woman. What yeah. a woman. Thank you. Um, you mentioned your faith. Yes. Is that all, was that what, did you discover faith when you were growing up? Yeah, um, well, I discovered, 
my faith when I was, I mean, I, we, we went to Sunday school growing up. I definitely wouldn't say I had a, a re relationship with, with God or, you know, had a strong faith back then. Um, but as I got into my, my late 20s, you know, I started to go to church and I'm a, I'm a Christian. And, I, you know, my faith really does anchor me because you were an MP yourself. You know what that place can be like. It's, it's, it's a tough space yes. to navigate. And so I'm very grateful for that. And, you know, within Parliament, we have groups and settings where we can really gather and come together and support one another. And that's important. That's that, And, and that'd be cross party as well, that you it can is, talk yeah. to each other mm, and, and, and celebrate your faith or yeah. practice your faith. Yeah. Who cares what party you're in? Exactly. That's, that's bigger. Than, there is, there is that. I think, our, you know, our faith comes above everything, you know, regardless of your political affiliations. Faith is so important. <clears throat> and there are the sisterhoods in Parliament. You know, I've got some great, there are some great women there who who are incredibly supportive as well, which I'm so grateful for. Who's your best mate in Parliament? <laughs> My best mate's Kate, Kate in Parliament, Kate Ossimore. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Um, so you win a Tory seat. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I no mean, you're, I, I could. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we didn't. No, I mean, because yeah. I was in Parliament yeah, during that time. Yeah. Nobody expected to win Battersea. No, yeah. Which yeah. you won. Yeah. I mean, um, can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we did. I mean, honestly, I mean, that I remember being selected as a candidate there and, you know, everyone's saying, OK, it's be great experience. You're not going to win. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be good experience. I remember phoning my mum and saying, first person I called, I said, oh, mum, you know, don't worry. I'm not going to win, but I've been selected for Batsy and I'm going to, you know, go and learn, you know, learn how to be a good candidate, essentially. Um, but we ran an amazing campaign. I mean, I was so blown away by the volunteers and supporters and the activists that came down to Battersea to help. And, you know, people also clearly wanted some change as, as well. And, you know, obviously they had a good candidate. That goes without saying. But we also had some radical policies there and, you know, issues like Brexit played a factor. Um, and the, you know, the reverse way it's the reverse to, to, for you, to, to, yeah. did in mind. You yeah. were literally my opposite, <laughs> yeah, actually. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but also, you know, it was clearly for that time and that moment that I was I was meant to be there. And you know, again, I'm anchored in my faith. And so if it was gonna be, it was gonna be, and it certainly was. And you know, I can't explain what an honour it is. Well, you've been there, you know what exactly what it's like to represent people and to be their voice. And that's kind of what I spent my life doing, you know, campaigning and being an advocate for disabled people and their rights, but to do it for everybody. It's an incredible honour. I'm really proud to do what I do. So you get to Parliament, <laughs> oh, yeah. like the physical building. Yeah. It is difficult to describe to people who haven't been in it mm. just how many stairs, corridors, how difficult it is to remember yeah. where anything is. Yeah. It must have been a nightmare. For, it's a nightmare for everybody. Yeah. But was it a particular nightmare for you, Judy? Exactly. So add on a few more layers of how difficult it must have been. You've pointed out already, I mean, the one thing, the lighting, particularly where my office is, I'm in the Palace of Westminster. There's loads of windows, there's no daylight. There's no daylight. <laughs> my windows look at another building. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's my view. Um, but, you know, so I need really good light. Um, but also just navigating the space of corridors and narrow, there's lots of stairs. It's not an accessible building. And I'm so hoping as part of the whole restoration of the estate, you know, accessibility is gonna have to be front and center to make sure that that place is inclusive for everybody. You know, we've got, you know, corridors, we've got glass doors as well that are just impossible to navigate. And it is not the best workplace when it comes to access. And, you know, I'm grateful that I'm there to be able to kind of be a champion along with other people, particularly colleagues in, in, the, in the House of Lords as well, who are really, you know, championing the need for parliament to be better and to do better. So there's the Equality Act, which the last Labour government introduced, Harriet Harman introduced. Absolutely, so, yeah. so every workplace has to put in place reasonable adjustments. adjustments. Yeah. How do you make reasonable adjustments in a place like that? Have they done it? What more needs For to me, be done? For me, I mean, obviously, they. I, I'm going to be honest, when I got elected, I mean, the calls came in the next morning about, can you come down now so we can sort you up with an off? You know, they really went one step above and beyond to really make sure that I was settled. Like, you know, you've been an MP, you don't get an office straight away. Yeah. I got mine straight away, you know, got right. one straight away you know, had choices as well, which was very good. Um, and things and, you know, talking about the different kinds of support that I would need. Um, but, you know, we're still not there yet. We still have a bit of a way to go. I still don't always get my papers on time in the right format because I need things in at least... We're talking about the daily order paper. Daily order paper. Which, you, which is just lying around, which we all 
just pick yeah. up. Yeah. But actually, you, that's that, no good that's, for you. That's the one. No, I have to have mine in large font. Of course and, you do. You know, nowadays, now what they're doing, they're making that available to everyone, which is great. So now the daily order paper that's online, they have a large print copy online now as well. Because they, they do one for me. So all my papers have to, to be in large print legislation, you know, statements, all documents. So, you know, it doesn't always happen on time. And... You, you bet your dollar that if it's not on time, I will go into that chamber and make a noise about it because it's not acceptable. I have to have everything at the same time as everybody else. So you mentioned lighting, mm. mentioned obviously the size of print. Yeah. And anything else on your demand list? Yeah, my demand. So I also have a personal assistant who acts as my eyes, essentially, um, a sighted assistant. So when I'm out and about in my constituency or navigating the estate, or, you know, doing events, I'll always have um, a sighted assistant. And I've been really lucky to have some incredible people working with me because that kind of role, Gloria, it requires a great amount of trust from me. It's because the same person that does it? That, that it you have one, one sighted assistant? One person that does that, yeah. I had one person who was with me since I got elected. Um, and then she, um, after three and a half years, she moved on and I've had somebody else since. And again, it's building that trust because it's a degree of vulnerability from my part as well that I have to expose that side of me because a lot of people that see me do not know that I've got my condition because I hide it so well apparently um but you know stick me in an environment where I'm you know not familiar with it then I am lost I mean I can recall not long ago I was having to go to a dinner and uh, my usual taxi service wasn't available so I used an alternative one and um he dropped me at the wrong location it was dark it was wet raining and I was just stranded on my own, you know, this was recent. And, you know, my, my dear friend, he obviously tracked me, found me and all the rest of it. But that's what I have to go through sometimes. And it's horrible. And, you know, it's just part of my life. I feel utterly inspired listening to you. <laughs> and I think people who are watching this will feel the same. Thank you. It's gone oh. so quickly. Oh, thank you. It's been really good talking to you. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. You can watch my Real Me interviews on our YouTube channel or catch them on the Real Me podcast. You can listen on iTunes, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for GB News. You have been watching The Briefing with me, Gloria Shapiro. I'm back on Monday. Liam Halligan brings you On The Money in a moment. But first, it is time for your weather.